Hi everyone, today's video is going to be a little different from most of our other classic video game themed videos. This is going to be more about the sort of history and the marketing aspect of a really classic 8-bit game, one that I think had a big impact on both Corey and myself. And Corey is here with me today as always. Say hi, Corey. Hey, how's it going? So if you can't tell already by what's on my screen here, it's going to be about Super Mario 2. And for fellow Americans like Corey and myself, we might not recognize this as being anything but some level we don't remember from Mario 1 or a ROM hack of Mario 1. But this was the real Mario 2 as released in Japan and for the longest time not released in America. And the right. Super Mario 2 that Americans are used to looked like this. So let me go back to the beginning of this video here. And you can see the aesthetic was uh, extremely close to what we ended up uh, worldwide, what was Super Mario 3. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, you could choose from many more characters, including Princess Peach and Toadstool. It was also, I believe, the first game to introduce a uh, slightly different uh, looking Luigi who was taller and had different attributes to his brother. He was no longer just a simple recolor. Although I think he went back to being just a recolor in Mario 3. Am I mistaken? Do you remember? Uh, I think? Yeah, I believe he was just a recolor then. Um, yeah. And I, I I think that, you know, that decision was made because they were continuing the original series of right. Mario. And also, I think, because maybe from a design standpoint, they didn't want a character that could do different things in that particular game. Right. Um, and I would which, assume that another concern could have been memory constraints, where they already had so much new and unique uh material going into Mario 3 with all the different suits and everything imagine right. you ha imagine if you had to have a different looking body and head for Mario versus Luigi and a different version of all of those suits for both Mario and Luigi oh yeah that, that would have been, been a lot. really expensive uh back in the day when Mar uh cartridge memory was so expensive mhm mm yeah, and it's interesting that they made that decision for Luigi in this game because, I, and I'm not sure if it's if it's exactly true, but I know that the ability to jump higher was one of the original characters that they reskinned. Right, and, and we should get uh, onto that topic. Uh, we right. did not yet mention Doki Doki Panic, which right. was it's what this game was before it was reskinned for American audiences to be the American version of Super Mario 2. And do you want to go into that a little brief bit of history a bit, Corey? Yeah. Um, so what happened was, I think it was 86, or I think they com the Japanese Mario 2 was created uh, a matter of months, uh, less than a year after the first Mario. They, they made it very quickly. And, it, and I'm not going to say that you know it shows or anything, because <laughs> they, they are literally using the same a lot of the right. same graphics it definitely shows that game. it's yeah, not necessarily a problem but it shows no no uh and it was made early enough to where you could say well it, it, it was pretty early in terms of the japanese release right yeah however by the time that came to america it was sent to nintendo of america and uh they had a particular person there uh his name was howard phillips i don't remember his uh exact job title uh, but he was fairly high up at the company. His job was to play these Japanese uh, Famicom games and decide, you know, what games might have been appropriate for U.S. audiences or, or players, rather. And, uh, you know... And, and maybe even what changes might need to be made to make right. a game uh, more appropriate for or more attractive to American audiences, right? It, Exactly, and I yeah. think by the time he got his hands on the official Mario 2, he he sort of had this reaction of, uh, you know, hey, like, this not only looks very much like the first game, but it's incredibly difficult. Like, uh, right. people that play it will tell you it's so much harder than even Mario 1. Right. And uh, he felt like it just wasn't fun, 
And by yeah. the time they could mass produce it and get it on the market, it just wouldn't uh, be able to compete with what was what was coming out in America at the time. Right. And uh, and rightfully so. I mean, that, yeah. that's a very you know you got to think. Uh, by the time '87 comes around, you start having stuff like Mega Man. And, right. uh, you, you know, Capcom and Konami were really pushing the envelope in terms of what a game could look like and, and sound like. And right. uh, so he, he, he went, he, you know, he went to his boss and he, and he talked about it. And it started an entire conversation about, well, what can we do to make not just this game, but a, a proper Mario 2 right. for the United States? So, right. yeah. And, and uh, uh, yeah. So what? Uh, so the story behind that is there was they they you know Nintendo had at one point helped develop a game called Doki Doki Panic. Right. The uh, same which, producer who created Mario in the first place and uh, right, much of the right. same development team, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a lot of the same people who who worked on that game, and so they were they were literally with that game, even right. though it was a different IP. Being Doki Doki uh, pa Panic, the game. Right. right. Yeah. They were trying. They were still coming off of that inspiration from Mario and trying to make an improved Mario to an extent. Uh, right. Obviously, that wasn't literally the case. Right. And I, I believe the game was developed for a special event in Japan right. uh, with the help of Nintendo, and it became its own uh, game released in Japan. However, right. Nintendo saw this game and they were like, "Hey, this is." This could be it, you know. This could be what right. we what we do, and I believe the as far as legalities go, they had the rights to everything in the game except for the four main characters. Right, right? They, Nintendo, those were the licensed characters, the IP. Right. But the the code itself, the level design, all of this stuff, it was their creative property. Right. So they could reskin it into a uh, whatever kind of game they wanted to, which yep. uh, it was a, certainly a brilliant choice and also an obvious choice <clears throat> as you were mentioning Miyamoto his attitude going into it according to himself I believe he had it his frame of mind was I want to make a, a good very Mario like game that's almost like a continuation of the Mario genre of gameplay and just not just have it not in the since he had to make this game for this uh this license, this uh, Doki Doki Panic, I think it was a manga or anime or both, and um, it just it worked out so well. And, and I really have to hand it to what was his name, uh, John? Uh, it was uh, Howard Phillips. How, Howard Phillips. But um, yeah, he. Uh, I, I really um, think I think he was right on the money. I think he, I think he was very correct with this idea. I think it made perfect sense. For Mario 2 in Japan to look like this, to just be a fast new set of levels, basically, for Mario 1. Mario 1 was the pack-in game. Everyone was already used to Mar Mario 1. They liked it, but they weren't... Like, when Mario 2 came out in Japan, it, was, it made a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. But by the time everything was over in America, and you had this... Uh, longer pause in these sort of later generation 8-bit Nintendo games that were starting to appear with such higher visual quality and, and gameplay sensibilities and um, stuff and audio quality it's certainly I think I think his attitude was right I think a lot of Americans would be wondering why they would spend full price on a Mario 2 that just even back then people would have realized that this is they took the same game and they changed levels around, basically. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. did add some new stuff, but to a very minor degree. I don't think it would have done that well in the market, especially compared to those other games. Meanwhile, the other really cool thing is here they had this game, this great game, Doki Doki Panic, which would not have sold well in America because no one in America would have known what the heck Doki Doki Panic was. Right. Right? So it's you take the best of both worlds. You have this very high quality game the game basically the game engine uh and they even reused most of the uh, the audio and the music and everything and, and even the enemies they just switched out the sprites and tweaked some of the gameplay to match mario more like the uh doki doki panic apparently did not have the ability to run by holding the attack button 
Right, um, right. And uh, oh, when you when you lose hit points, you shrink down to the smaller size. They mm-hmm. added that in as well, but otherwise, it was uh, already a finished game. So virtually all of the debugging was done, all of the coding, the vast majority of art. So suddenly that gave the team the, there was not much work to do to uh, reskin or convert it into a much more impressive uh, continuation of the franchise. Yeah, and if you look at Doki Doki Panic, this, like the the evidence is there that mo- you know people who created Mario worked on it because they actually put in Mario items in the game, like coins. Right. The POW block was originally there in that game. Uh, that was from the original Mario Brothers, you know what right, I mean? Right. And uh, now, once they converted it to Mario 2, they did go further with it and added things like the mushrooms and, right. you know, to to really sell the, the, the Mario brand work. recognition. Yeah. Right. And, um, but so, it, it's funny because it was a game that was inspired by Mario, created by some of the same people. Right taken and made into an official Mario game. It is, it's strange right. how it happened, but uh, it's it's a fascinating thing. But uh, Yeah, it really is. And, um, yeah, it's just it's... Um, I-, I can remember uh, having the Ape at Nintendo for a little while but not having many games for it and being kind of stuck at the time with Mario 1 and I got to visit a relative that had this game and as soon as I discovered that this cartridge lying sort of under their uh, coffee table and and just uh, started playing it it just blew my mi- my mind the uh the extent to which especially the graphics but just everything the gameplay sort of how sophisticated the gameplay was how um how it was clear they were really trying much harder to create this cohesive world aesthetically and with this character set and just really start to give the characters different attributes and different personality types and uh, to really tell more of a story other than to just have a very minute uh, sort of plot to make the game progress. Right. It was just much richer and I I was really impressed. And same thing with just the art in general and the sprite art. It was just uh, leaps and bounds beyond what Mario, which I already really liked the first Mario game, but it just I was enthralled with this game and, and played and I pretty much ignored the relatives that we went to visit and, and played this game the whole time. But ironically, right. they ended up just mostly watching me play anyway because they hadn't gotten <laughs> that far. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, just a fantastically high quality game. And that is an interesting thing. Like we had a brief conversation about this earlier. And like you mentioned, a lot of people, a lot of Americans now know that this game is a reskin, that it was not originally created as part of the Mario franchise. Mm-hmm. But in an, in an interesting sense, a lot of people don't realize that Doki Doki Panic was made by Miyamoto, the same guy that invented Mario, and his attitude at the time was he wanted to create a very Mario-like game, like a higher quality Mario-like game, to take what he was doing with Mario that step further. So in a sort of spiritual sense, ironically, it was sort of uh, a sort of um, separated at birth, so to speak, Mario game that ended up being brought back into the family after the fact uh, due to this um, pushback by the American guy at uh, Nintendo USA who was hired specifically to make these kind of decisions. And apparently, uh, as the, I think as the story goes, when he was being um, offered the job, one of the criteria that he, basically one of his demands to take the job was he needed final say on what games made it into the American market. And right. they, they agreed to that, but then they were very upset when he pushed back, when they showed him Mario 2, the, the actual original Japanese Mario 2, when they showed that to him and said, hey, you know, let's get this going, let's make some more money, uh, he was like, he pushed back and he said, no, this, this isn't going to do what you think it's going to do in the American market. We should not release this game. And he, uh, according to the story, he had to remind them of their promise to let him make the final decision. 
and they were not happy with it, but they honored the decision and it proved to be, in my opinion, a very good one. It really sort of reawakened, I can speak from firsthand uh, experience, reawakened and, and, and further kindled the love of the franchise. And it took, I mean, at that point with Mario 1, he was an incredibly forgettable character. And um, right, most right. Americans, the, the, even the idea of a mascot was almost non-existent at the time. We had discussed this earlier. The only other potentially earlier mascot we can think of is Pac-Man, who ended up mm -hmm. with a series with, with the spinoffs like Miss Pac-Man, and then eventually much, much later, things like Pac-Mania and Pac-Land. The first real quintessential uh, mascot that we can think of is Mario, but th that wouldn't would not have been the case as far as I'm concerned with the Japanese Mario too. It was still just like a really personality list, blocky, non-appealing, like tiny step up from Atari Twenty Six Hundred sprite. Yeah, and the funny thing is, is is that if you look at you know what we now know to be Mario and what yep. he looks like. If you go back and kind of track, you know, how he changed yeah. and looked originally, there was this, you know, cartoony old 2D version of him, you know, right. a, a very, which was used in marketing even for the original Mario 2 in Japan. Mm -hmm. He was on the, the disc for it because it was for like the disc Famicom. Do we whatever. have an image of that? This is the... Um... Uh, this is the American Mario 2. Right. But he pretty much looks the same as this Mario. It's right. not the same drawing, but it's it's the same aesthetic. So even right. going that far back in 86, they were marketing Mario this way, where they had defined that mascot character, right. but he didn't look, look that, that way, way in, in the, the game. game yet. Exactly. And then Mario 2, when they did this reskin, he did, finally, look yeah. like he did. That is a really cover. charming sprite. And, and the, I think yeah. that's almost pixel for pixel, if not the identical to what they end up using in Mario 3, isn't it? It's it's very close. I think it's maybe the, the eyes are a little different, but yeah, um, yeah it's very close. And um, I think the reason for that is because if you look at the dates on these releases, Mario 2 USA was released in October of 88. Right. And the reskinning Mario, of Mario right. Two was overlapping with the development of the of Mario Three, because yes. Mario Two had already been out in Japan. They were working on Mario Three, so the American Mario Two got to benefit probably from the fact that they were already redoing the sprite graphics to that much higher new standard. Yep. So, uh, yeah, and it's just, uh, I mentioned this before uh, in our previous uh, off-air conversation that uh, imagine what an incredible jump that was in Japan to go from Mario 1 and then Mario 2, which looked like slightly better than Atari 2600 games with very, I would say, uncharming graphics all the way right. to Super Mario 3. Right, With, right. N without anything in between, and to me, the transition for us Americans was so much smoother. I agree. Yeah, because we had this as Mario two, and it took us. We had already been shown by some third party games uh, by uh, amazing developers like Capcom and Konami what the 8-bit Nintendo was actually capable of. It was sh getting rid of. It was separating itself from that sort of earlier generation of like early uh, arcade and atari 2600 aesthetic and it was really moving into the modern pixel art age of games uh, right, or the, right. the beginnings of it where things were becoming much more actually cartoon like instead of being just oh well we have these blocks to work with so we're going to do the best we can and this mm -hmm. sort of just generally low standard suddenly you had just these artists that were standing on the shoulders of those previous artists and now perhaps starting to be uh, influenced by video games that were starting to appear in the arcades that were much higher powered 8 or even 16-bit uh, systems. So just the the, uh, the standards were so much higher now um, right. that for us, this uh, for for the Americans, it was a it was a very nice transition from Mario 1 to 2, this big improvement, and then from 2 to 3, 
where the graphical improvement from two to three is not as extreme, the uh, the gameplay it went back to be even more on point, more quintessentially Mario, and uh, the graphics were just beautiful, very clean. The aesthetic, the it was nailed. The the sort of aesthetic canon of what it is to be a Mario game and Mario sprites and Mario environment. By the time of Mario three, they just nailed it. And right. uh, so y you could tell that it had hit, like this was like the sort of pinnacle Mario game. Everything was just perfectly cemented. Everything was perfectly visualized, I guess you could say, or, or uh, realized. Yes, and from a marketing, yeah, from a, the marketing side of things, Mario 2 was such a huge deal in America because the very first Nintendo Power released was Mario 2 on the cover. Right. They used this reskinning of this game for Mario 2 as sort of the the way to almost launch Mario yeah. as a franchise in America. Don't get me wrong, the first game was pivotal and popular, right. but this solidified what Mario was from that moment right. forward, at least in the United States. Right. Um, it went from so, being the pack-in game to right. a juggernaut mascot. Exactly. And exactly. The, the keep in mind, everyone, the American market was immensely important. And uh, I, I believe, even at the time, uh, quite, a, quite a bit larger source of income for Nintendo mm -hmm. even than J Japan, even though, while being a smaller country with a smaller population, the, um, you know, Japanese culture is so extremely pro video game that they they do a very uh, impressive amount of video game purchasing. But the American market is so huge that I'm sure it was a really big deal. Uh, this uh, this decision and how well what was it the ended up being the third uh, best selling 8 bit Nintendo game ever. Yeah, I believe so. It was something like 10 million worldwide or something units. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, you add up those dollars. Yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> so imagine they made their money from. They made their money with Doki Doki Panic. Then they retake that game. They use, you know, uh, they do a quick reskin. And in their most important market, they have a smash hit. Whereas if they released Super Mario 2, it, it would have not only not sold much at all most likely, especially at full game price for a new game. Uh, but it literally could have... Um, it could have created a boredom, if not outright distaste for the franchise, instead of... You know what I mean? Like, Mario may have never have become the beloved mascot well, globally and, that he ended up becoming. And here's here's the, the, the way the facts fall, right? I mean, the only games on the NES that sold better than Mario 2 were Mario 3, right. which was released afterward. Of course. And yeah. Duck Hunt and Mario Brothers, the pack-in games. Right. So, like, as an, like, so at its time when it was released, it was the only game on the market uh, that was released on its own that sold that much ever until Mario 3. So, right. and it's the only other game that beat it after that. So, right. that tells you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's. I, I don't know who made the specific. I'm assuming Miyamoto was the the driving force, but uh, whoever made that decision uh, to pick and reskin this game. I mean, it may have been of so obvious and so forced. Like, same developer, they had the legal rights. It was a done game. It was. It would be quick to reskin. All mm -hmm. the stars aligned. But it, it all depended on this pushback. It never would have been happened. It never would have even been thought of if it weren't for the pushback of this one guy who said, mm, we Americans aren't going to really appreciate a harder leveled, uh, just quick sort of, you know, new level re-release of Mario 1 as a whole new game that we're supposed to pay uh, full price for. Right. And yeah, I, I think I think it was a great decision and, uh, and I... Uh, Huge respect for that decision and for the uh, Japanese Nintendo uh, executives to honor their uh, their promise and to trust him, even though they were, according to what I had heard, pretty upset about it. 
Right. right. And and I do believe that this this game is one of the games that that helped this whole notion here is that this is when games you know, you look at Mario One and you're like, okay, you see it for what it is. It's, you, you know, it, graphically, okay, it is what it is. Like, they were obviously thinking in terms of, well, what works best in this particular moment. Right. They weren't thinking, like, we're going to make an aesthetic and a soundtrack and everything that's going to carry this entire game into a form of art. You know, this is right. when things, as far as console games go, uh, arcades were already doing this at the time, but they were transitioning from, okay, they're just little time wasters like the old arc Atari games and stuff into, okay, this is an art form. This is a serious art form that people can make beautiful things with. Right. And Mario 2 it, like embodies that. It has a great soundtrack, which actually yeah. is the original Doki Doki, 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 Doki soundtrack. Yeah. And, um, but they improved lots of things like the sound effects mm-hmm. and stuff like that made them much more appealing. But, um, it, it it started to you know then 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 you see it's hard pressed to find anything before 1988 besides maybe Mega Man and Castlevania that were really uh, really artistically beautiful on that system. I mean yeah. it, it's very difficult. But after that, I mean <laughs> think of what happened. You, you had Mega Man two. You had follow ups to Castlevania that were excellent. You had Ninja Gaiden, you had Double Dragon. I mean all the stuff that was coming out eighty eight, eighty nine and into the nineties was, was getting beautiful. And then of course you go into sixteen bit era right. and uh, it all just starts to fly, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like I was saying, it really did have a massive impact on me the first time I got to see and play Mario 2. And it really, even in the time, felt like this pivotal change in, obviously, the the developers. But then after that, everyone's idea and attitude of just what a video game could be and how it just really was blossoming into its own art form, not only for gameplay design, but just visual appeal and visual communication. And it really was an amazing change from that sort of uh, Atari, kind of what you were describing earlier, this sort of mostly black screened Atari attitude, which was much more like, oh, it's just like a, you know, 15 minute time waster kind of thing. Right. right. Uh, A much more sort of disposable attitude toward games. And it was just with Mario, too, it just really it was one of the games in the earliest moment of that transformation obviously capcom and konami and some other studios were really you know pushing that at the same time but uh yeah mario 2 was one of those really big games that really helped transform everything and lead into that sort of what i still consider the golden age of uh, 2d video games which uh didn't last as long as a lot of people might think so we're talking right. about like the middle to end of the 8-bit era and then the 16-bit era which we're talking like roughly a decade and then you mm-hmm. know shortly after that you had the uh, introduction of stuff like Doom and and uh Wolfenstein and then that quickly soon enough everyone was pushing 3D and I've got no problem at all with great 3D games even some of the early generation stuff now which in most people's opinion didn't age as well as classic retro pixel art games yeah um, but it, I don't I think you uh, I think we're pretty much in agreement we're both you know obviously being 2D artists ourselves and just loving the sort of media of 2D game design I just feel like there should have been a much longer and a never ending uh, instead of going almost completely to 3D I feel like there should have been a div- uh, a branching out where now there were lots of great 3D games and 2D games just got better and better and benefited from this enhancement in technology that allowed simultaneously for 3D games to get better, but would have also allowed for 2D games to just become amazing with more layers of scrolling, bigger bosses, being able to pan the camera, in and out, all of those cool things that some, you know, the occasional 2D game did come around to make use of that. One of the great examples, which unfortunately became like a swan song for for 2D pixel art games, was uh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Right, yeah. And uh, But yeah, you just end up with that situation where suddenly there was this massive push, especially in America, the video arcades with the 
more powerful 16-bit systems and then 32-bit was falling away. There wasn't that appeal anymore. There were consoles and computers in people's homes that could give the same kind of gaming experience. And and then you had that this push to sell the 3D power of consoles and, and it was all about the sort of technology war. The hints of it, I, I think I mentioned this in a previous video, but even though the quality was still very high, I still sensed it even back in the day the first time I finally got to play Super Mario World, the first day I had set up the Super Nintendo when we finally got one, mm -hmm. and uh, I had so I had so looked forward to playing this game, and it is a fantastic game. But gameplay-wise, it was a step backwards in my opinion from Super Mario Three. Right, right. And there was just less creativity in general, and but you could tell there was this push. We've got to show off Mode Seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there, there were these gimmicks, and some of them were done decently well. But even at that point, it started becoming more and more about showing off the technology than just really careful and thoughtful and innovative gameplay design. Yeah, and if you fast forward to today, I mean, obviously, we, we have hardware now, uh, even in just your your average phone, that can push graphics that look immaculate you know as, as detailed as you want them to be as far as level of detail just about and I, I guess what i'm trying to say is we are at that point now to where the hardware kind of doesn't matter anymore it, it's really just about what aesthetic you want to go with yeah and i i believe that that's part of our philosophy with the games that we're creating is that we we do look back and we see these masterpieces back in the day right. and how that was kind of a short-lived period and how you know it's a shame. Had there been the developers now, you know, the amount of right. game developers and things like that back then, what could have been done during that era? And I right. think that speaks to, you know, the kinds of stuff we want to create. So. Yeah, exactly. There's there's a certain sense to the gameplay, to the visual styles and, and everything else that sadly a giant chunk of the developers and the, the consumer base, they lost or forgot this love for really classic 2D arcade and console style games. And don't get me wrong, you know, there are a lot of really great 3D games that I play and enjoy myself, but it's a very, very different experience. Yeah, and when I yeah, want great. to play a 2D game, no 3D game can scratch that itch. And exactly. vice versa, that's fine. But they're very different experiences and they're, in it, to me, they're equally entertaining. And they're very different art forms, and I really like being able to... So I'm always really appreciative when a new 2D developer, mostly indie these days, makes a really great 2D uh, retro-style game. And, Agreed, um, yeah. and it's just really cool now that there, there is this technology now. Like you could, you could get like a $30 Android phone or tablet that has power that something that's incredibly powerful compared to even the the neo geo you know right. like you could get a you could get a 40 dollar android phone that can emulate a neo geo at full speed and exactly. uh, can do 2d games at like eight times the on-screen resolution with a bunch of layers of scrolling and you know suddenly the creative person doesn't have to worry about how many sprites can i fit per scan line how many colors per sprite so there's this immense amount of potential and uh, game developing. There are just incredibly good development systems these days that even allow non-programmers to be able to make very high quality 2D games very quickly. You know, the bottleneck almost always being the actual art and level design and stuff like that is going to take the bulk of the, the development time. Um, right. But it's just never been so possible for creative people to create amazing 2d games and it is happening and yep, uh, yeah yeah it, it's a shame that everything and it is it, it feels like there's a big shift coming because there's a lot of triple a 3d game studios kind of falling to pieces agreed um, uh, yeah and you look at what's going on now i mean you have the current consoles which are getting close to the end of their lifespan right and he makes you wonder, like, what are they going to do next? What, what are they really just going to say? Oh, we've got this much more horsepower right. in our console, and it's going to look that much better. I mean, oh, everything's right. going to be in 4K or whatever. It's are, are people 
how long are people going to chase that technological right. advancement right. before they take a step back and say, hey, you know, I- I've played GameCube games, I've played right. Super Nintendo games that that are better than half the stuff out right now. Right. Well, it's, and, yeah. You know, and they, and, they, and and start to question why is that? Well, it's you know? really interesting, too, because if you think of it, back in the day, consoles were attractive to parents with children, and a whole generation of children grew up with consoles. But all of those kids grew up, and remember, like, those parents didn't really play video games a couple generations ago. Right, right. But now, like, those people grew up, and they had kids, and those people grew up, and they had kids. So we're all gamers now. Right. You know? And now all of those people, they they grew up, and they bought PCs, and they powered up their PCs to be able to play high-end games on a PC. So a lot of the console people have jumped ship to PC, Mm -hmm. and then even a lot of the big IP holders they're shifting gear massively to because it's a bigger um, uh, amazingly now it's a bigger market they can spend less money to develop a game and make more money on a on a mobile game these days mm-hmm. than they can taking the risk to to uh you know to pay a bunch of people over a th- hundred thousand dollars a year to make one single game for pcs or console and then risk, you know, if if a competing game that's similar comes out but is better or has better marketing, you're in big trouble. Or you yeah, know, yeah, like, it's it's massive risk to take to yeah. to spend years, yeah, five, uh, six, seven millions years. of dollars to all these people for your one shot, your one little right. window to make most of your money. And uh, right, yeah. So yeah, people have to even these large companies. They're gonna have to take a step back and think about what they're doing. Now right. I think Nintendo as a company handles things surprisingly well. I think that's why right. they they always design their hardware to maybe be a step back in terms yeah. of power. But once once they hit the switch, and I think that's part of why it's doing so well. Is it's right. like okay, yeah, it might only have the power of a 360 or something like that, an Xbox, but. Can people really tell now? Right. Can people really look at that and say it looks massively worse than, you know, something else? I mean, yeah, right. there might be some games ported that you notice a little bit of a difference, but mm-hmm. I mean, what what can you really add at this point that's going to make it look that much better? How many more pixels does it take right. to make it look like a photograph? While I agree with you, you know? while I agree with you, I think we are showing our age and our dispositions <laughs> uh, toward two D graphics. Because I know and I've spoken with a lot of people that adamantly they're those hardware chasers and they're they're just really bothered if they can see any pixelation or tech or or um fuzziness to a texture and, and stuff like that. And it's just Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that if, yeah. if that's if that's what people want. Uh there right. those people exist. But yeah. um we we definitely look more at the aesthetic of the right. game exactly, rather and than, your point, rather than the power of the game. And so. your point with Nintendo, I completely agree with. Their gimmick has gimmick quote unquote has always been. It's not about the horsepower. It's about the creativity. It's not exactly. about how powerful the hardware is. It's about what unique fun thing does the hardware offer. And sometimes they drop the ball with what was it the um, Virtua Boy. Right, and right, uh, yeah. you know, arguably the Wii U, and uh, but um, the point is, is starting with the Super Nintendo and its near perfect uh, control pads with the shoulder buttons, uh, and then the DS and the 3DS and uh, the Wii. It was always about intentionally not taking part in the hardware war, the horsepower war, and always saying we offer something that's more universally appealing and offers a unique experience that none of the other competitors can offer you, which is a really smart business. And uh, very much, I, I really appreciate that as a just a creative person in general. Yeah, like, I, I like that attitude of, I'm, you know, it, it's kind of like, would you rather watch, and hey, it depends on your mood, would you rather watch two skillless giant bruisers trading punches to the head you know what I mean? As like a, a boxing match or something. Or would you rather watch uh, two really skilled martial artists having a bout? Exactly. It's you know what I mean? Two or, very, very different things. Yeah, or know. even, you know, a really skilled martial artist having a, a go at a bruiser with almost no skill but a lot of size and strength. You know, that would be interesting too. 
But the, mm-hmm. the point is, it's um, offering that very different thing that is much more, if you want to put a negative spin on it, kind of artsy fartsy and cerebral, but it's uh, <laughs> j- just, you know, a, a more, the, the best example I can come up with from my own memory is when one of the later generation 3D consoles, but this was back in the day, keep in mind. So this this is when stuff was starting to really become impressive, uh, but it, very much the heyday of the uh, hardware war. It was probably like the Xbox 360 or something. And, and I go into a local, I think it was a Target or something, and they have one of these systems on display. I don't think they were even for sale yet, but they had one sort of demoing. And there was this boxing game. Mm-hmm. And they had these for the time incredibly high poly incredibly well textured boxers doing their thing and there were like what may as well have been ray traced beads of sweat following physics dripping down these boxers arms you know what i mean right right that like and 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 the game played horribly (laughs) it played horribly all of their development time all of their focus was on showing off the technology. And meanwhile, the gameplay was just... The the characters, the control was terrible. The characters moved in an incredibly unnatural and unrewarding way. It was just uncreative. There There was no redeeming quality to the actual game as a game. But it had the wow factor of the technology um, right and don't right. get the me selling wrong, point it's, was yeah. the detail of the boxers and right. whether they looked exactly like the boxers and right. you know nothing wrong with people who love that kind of stuff that's fine right. uh, people are fans of things like right. that and sport, it's great that but... creative people have that kind of horsepower that they can use right the problem right. is it's all too often you end up with companies studios that place the budget and the time and the manpower and the skill they even decide who to hire and it's all the focus suddenly becomes on people that are going to show off the technology instead of people that are going to design really compelling and fun games and i definitely noticed that shift and don't get me wrong there's some really fantastic 3d franchise some of my favorite games are 3d games but right. uh, there was this massive, like I said, even starting with the Super Nintendo, there was that little drop down once they were really focusing on showing off the new technology, uh, in that case with Mode 7. But there was no 3D, and then all of the uh, studios, they were still competing. Now that that technology was established, they were still competing at a very high level, and we still had all of the 8-bit games and the, the Genesis slash Mega Drive games before then that set the bar pretty pretty high for creativity and gameplay so the bar got raised back again pretty quickly the games after the first generation um, right. in general were doing great with gameplay and creativity and stuff like that but then when 3d hit there were a lot of really bad games that everyone was so distracted like i can remember when we we uh, got a playstation when it was the the new thing that everyone had to have and we were super excited about games like Battle Arena Toshinden because of how great it looked. <laughs> and go ahead and try playing that game now. You're right. See, you know what I mean? You're like you could go back and play Super Mario two or three and have a blast. Yeah, even you, to this day, yeah. It's, you pick it's... up most of the first generation three <laughs> D games and even the ones I loved at the time, like I absolutely loved the Wipeout franchise. Uh I still have very high respect for it. But I went back somewhat recently and tried to play the very first one, and it was amazingly slow due to presumably not only the hardware constraints at the time, but also people weren't used to hyper high speed 3D racing games yet, Mm -hmm. right? So if they made it as fast as like the, the third installment of the game where it was incredibly fast because the technology and the, uh, sort of the players were now getting used to faster and faster racing it's an, an amazing franchise but uh, yeah and it, it, again it was sort of like uh the er- even the early 2d games where people were still trying to find their footing in terms of what worked best right. so that's what we were getting at the beginning of that 3d era i remember 
Yeah. Like, and and this speaks to a different franchise, but the Twisted Metal games, mm-hmm. I I always ha- had the thought that they hit their pinnacle with Twisted Metal Black on the PS2, mm-hmm. which was almost a, I think it was a launch title, if not very close to being a launch title, one of the first PS2 games yet masterfully made, right? Right. And I remember after playing that game when I first got it back in the day, I was like, oh, this makes me kind of nostalgic for. The older Twisted Metal games. So I I popped in Twisted Metal 2 and tried to play it again. And it was so massively worse. I mean, don't get me wrong, (laughs) classic game, really creative and fun at the time. But the physics were so bad and the, like, it just, it could, like, the controls were not there, you know? But they had refined it so much over the years that, see, see, it took 3D games almost a whole generation to get to that point where they were, they were feeling really nice and refined and beautiful and right. you know um so that's i think that's the lesson to be learned is like uh, there were some good early ps1 games that you know there was things like the tekken series and there right. was some good stuff in there but there was a lot of stuff that you would play and you're like you're expecting something right. great you might see a good screenshot right. but then once you play it and you see it moving you're you're right. just like Wow, I... But that, that is the interesting thing about 2D versus 3D as sort of artistic genre or, yeah, I don't know what the, what the perfect word is for it, but they're, they're two different but related art forms. But if you go back, like I could easily pick up old 16-bit fighting games, like I especially liked the uh, SNK, King of Fighters, Garou, Mark of the Wolves, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I uh, I play one of those games even to this day, and it's still beautiful and it plays incredibly well. Right, right. I loved the Tekken franchise in its prime up to uh, Tekken Tag Tournament, which is a fantastic game. Uh, extremely fun, especially if you if you have like a brother or a friend or a roommate to play with. Oh but, yeah, I had that game too. Yeah, I loved but, it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, good luck going back and enjoying Tekken One. You know what I mean? Right, like, the, right. The pixel yeah. art aesthetic holds up drastically better than early grimy, gr- uh, grainy, low poly 3D at a bad frame rate. Right. You know, yep. it's just and and I think I think it has a lot to do with the fact that in the case of 2D art and pixel art. Even though there's these color limitations and stuff like that, you're seeing the direct result of the work of human artists, right? So even though it's low resolution, even though it's low color, drastically more so than the power of the PlayStation to make a 3D game, the actual art is being filtered and degraded through these hardware limitations before it ends up on your screen in the case of 3D games. So a 3D artist has to design a model, they conceptualize it, you know, presumably at a higher resolution with better texture, but then they have to make it work within the system with all the other stuff that's going on. So they degrade it and then, you know, by the time it ends up on the screen, being rotated and rendered and then there's further color reduction issues and texture warping issues and all these other things and and then you take into account the added i I don't know what you would call this but like the fact that the player in a 3d game is mostly controlling the camera and the composition on screen so they may never get a good look at this enemy that you've spent all this time crafting you know what i mean uh maybe maybe that enemy pops up uh, so much in a certain area of the game, and then the player flies through that area, and they're on to the next thing. And like, you know, you as an artist would look at that and be like, "Man, I, I really put a lot of time into that guy," you know, and right. and this player just blows through it in this yeah, play. That's a really good and, point. Yeah, <laughs> you know? when when someone's doing two D graphics, whether it be cartoon animation or video game animation, you know exactly. The artist knows exactly what perspective the viewer is going to be seeing this animated character. They only have to animate the character for this one super specific angle. So it's guaranteed that the best choices that this artist made to communicate these things, to express the movement and attitude and, and intentions of this character in the moment, exactly the best possible version of that is on screen guaranteed 100% of the time 
Whereas with a, t- a 3D game, like you were hinting at, a 3D modeler models it, and then they've got these restrictions for polygon count and everything like that. So they're going to they're going to use most of the polygons for the stuff that's considered aesthetically the most important. So it could be the face, it could be the front of the character. But when you're playing the actual 3D game, you might never see. So and then they 3D animate an attack or whatever, or this cool dying animation. But the odds that you're ever going to see it and the ideal angle for that animation to play is astronomically low. Right. right. So that's another good point. It's just that, that that's a, I really think that I think we figured it out. That is why 2D pixel art games hold up so much better than early generation 3D games. You're, yep. The artist is able to adapt to and use at 100% everything at their disposal to be, to directly communicate with no lossy degradation no no translation so to speak through the system itself to end up giving you a display and the camera thing is another really big issue and of course the camera was one of the longest things a lot of games still wrestle with it in 3d games the yep. uh, just the wonky camera the the ai of the camera so often just can't figure out the where to go sometimes and it can be incredibly frustrating and mess up your experience yeah uh, it's uh, i think we should uh, force the conversation to end pretty soon this video is going on pretty long i hope it was uh, entertaining for everyone are there any uh, other thoughts that you wanted to cover uh, Corey, before we wrap this up uh, no i think that pretty much covers it all right. Yeah, I mean, I'll just really quickly, you had grabbed some screens. Let's see if anything uh, pops up uh, to us. Yeah, I mean, it's just really revolutionary. Oh, yeah, I did want to just quickly, for <laughs> other artists out there, just I wanted to pick on the cartooning on this box art just a little bit. And <laughs> the, <laughs> this fist is just incredible. I don't know what happened here. The thumb is uh, its own separate egg. Right. That's like right. glued to the sides of his fingers, and then there's extra lumps. Uh, especially this right here is just very strange. And then, yeah, I think I think you spotted this too. This looks like it's supposed to be the back of his hand wrapping around, and these are his three fingers. Otherwise, why would the leaves be covering and pushing back that other finger so much when you gra- gr- uh, grab something? That's not what happens. Right, right. So and even just like, comparing the two hands. Yeah, this like, one is like, massive. They're they're so they're so they're drawn differently, right, you know. Exactly. Like, uh... Different <laughs> different drawing style. This one is supposed to be further back than this one because it's behind the torso, behind the head. This one's in front of the torso, in front of the head, in front of that arm, so this one is closer up, but it's smaller. And then you've got this. It's it's like he uh, is having a severe allergic reaction to bee stings or something on this hand. Sure, uh, yeah. And there's a magic levitating egg. And then the other thing that looks really weird is the placement of this leg. It looks like it's coming out of the center of his pelvis, kind of like R2-D2. Had that, right, le- right. that middle leg in the front. <laughs> Which the problem there is because... The the artist put this line, which is like a sort of cuffing effect where the pants are kind of bunching up on the top of the shoe, but it creates the illusion of like that sort of the back of the calf, when in actuality this line is supposed to be the back of the calf. Right. And then that means this is the bend of the knee, and this can be considered the thigh. But this line comes down to a, to sh- at too sharp an, of an angle, and uh, uh, this line, uh, yeah, those two lines conflict each other, which pinches off the leg too much and makes it feel like it's coming out of the center of the torso instead of the the leg kind of starting here and going up. And then the other weird thing is this is supposed to be obviously the heel of a shoe, but instead of sticking out, it does this weird kind of folded in thing. So, but anyway, like I don't want to obviously... Everyone's at different skill levels and everyone has, you know, they work under time constraints and stuff like that and they get right. art sent back to them. And But it's just, it's just, these are the things to keep in mind if you're doing an illustration is just make sure if something's closer up, then it's bigger than the other thing, which you presume is going to be the same size, like the hand, you know, two hands. Usually 
they're about the same size on the same person but uh yeah it was just it was just funny to see this box art after decades and uh, see these glaring uh, illustration problems. I guess we will uh, wrap it up there. And um, yeah, and then here's the three box, which uh, the cartooning got much, much better by then. I'm guessing a different person, but you never know. But anyway, so that is it for this conversation. Thanks as always uh, for watching and thank you, Corey, for helping to uh, make this video and an interesting conversation. No problem. And uh, yeah. Thanks for watching.